reads, it says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all this service tonight. I pray, Holy Spirit, you will speak to everyone here. I pray, O oh God, for grace and help, revelation, Lord God. Father God, help me to communicate, Lord God, what is written in the scriptures, Lord God. And Lord, help me to be a poor of God tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, a few weeks ago, what inspired me for this sermon was I read a, an article in the newspaper about um, a, a mother in Atlanta, a black mother, who filed a federal discrimination lawsuit against the Mary Lynn Elementary School. Uh, and the reason why she uh, filed this lawsuit was that the principal of that school was segregating students according to color. Mm -hmm. So there were a few classrooms that were black and there's a few classrooms that were white. Now, what makes it more shocking is that it took place in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Atlanta is like the center of the black civil rights on land confiscated from blacks in 1929, mm -hmm. and it was an all-white school, but in 1965, because of Martin Luther King, the school was desegregated. Uh, both black and white children could come together in the same school, and so here in 2021, here is the reverse all over again. So think about it. It was once segregated, then it was desegregated, mm -hmm. and then now again it is segregated. And so this mother, when she found out that her child, her child was in a in an all black classroom, she was upset, and mm -hmm. so she sued. Yeah. Now this interesting situation was is that the head teacher was black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. It was a black woman that did this. And the reason why she did this, and you know, is that she is basically saying uh, that, you know, it is in the children's best interest. Now, now hear me for a moment. People in the Ku Klux Klan back in the day said it was in the children's best interest to segregate. Mm -hmm. And here's a woman now, a black woman in 2021, saying the same thing. Now, uh, uh, I understand where she was coming from because in America, there's still inequality in the educational system. Yeah. You know, according to a recent, recent stats, 87% of white children graduate from high school compared to 73%. So uh, there's all these inequalities, all of these issues. Uh, so yeah. this principal, this head teacher, recognized the fact that black students are, uh, are, 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 are probably less uh, able to graduate because of whatever the thing is, uh, and her solution was segregation. And so what inspired me for this sermon is the fact that just because you have a just cause doesn't mean you have a just solution. Mm. Are you hearing me today? And this is something that the world is getting caught up in. Yeah. Because A, the cause is just. We are looking for justice. We're looking to right wrongs. But just because you're looking to right wrongs doesn't mean the solution is right. Mm. And you've got to be very careful, church, uh, that you're not caught up in something uh, that just because someone has a passion for just causes, uh, that they at the same time have the right solution. You have got to show discernment as a Christian. And discernment is simply this. The ability to see the difference between what is right and what looks right. Sure. It doesn't take uh, much to see the difference between right and wrong. But to see the difference between what's right and what looks right is a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. I hear me today. And that is why I'm saying, you know, it's easy for people to get, oh, oh segregation. And then all of a sudden it's a black teacher. It's like, whoa, I never expected that. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So you've got to understand this today, and I don't want to call this sermon, Just Causes Need a Just God for Just Solutions. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me today? 
We need a just God to be involved in these just causes uh, if we are going to get just solutions. And so our text is dealing with the issue, you know, one of the ideas behind this that many people miss is the idea of justice. Here are the disciples in verse 6. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? Now, this is a phrase they've used a number of times uh, in the scriptures. One main example was when Christ was crucified uh, and they were walking down the road to Emmaus. Anyone remember the scripture? And mm -hmm. Jesus was walking beside him, but they did not recognize it was him. Mm -hmm. And they said, we had thought he would have restored the kingdom. We thought it was going to be he who restored the kingdom. And so what does it mean, restore the kingdom? Uh, you see... Israel at this time was a conquered nation. It was conquered by the Romans. Yeah. And the Romans were one of the most brutal empires that has ever crossed the face of the earth. The Romans uh, were, were, they were, I wouldn't say barbarians, but, but they did a lot of oppressive things uh, mm -hmm. in the name of conquering different tribes uh, and different nations. Uh, and so here are people who are oppressed in their own country by foreigners, by foreigners who don't worship the same God, mm. foreigners who worship uh, Jupiter and, and, and Mercury and all of these different gods, amen. And so imagine how you must feel as a proud Jew, that you are now conquered by heathen, people who don't believe in God, amen. Imagine how you must feel when the Roman soldier can tell you at any time to do whatever they've called you to do. You ever read a scripture where Jesus says, whoever compels you to go one mile, go two? Jesus is addressing that issue. A soldier could say to any Jewish person, stop what you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. You've got to pick up what I tell you to pick up and carry one mile. Mm -hmm. So imagine feeling like that in your own country. Feeling like a second class citizen in your own nation. Knowing the proud past your nation once had. Because the kingdom they're talking about is the, is bringing back the kingdom to the time where David and Solomon ruled. Mm -hmm. David created, in a sense, the kingdom of Israel. Up until David, Israel was a loosely confederation of 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. 12 tribes that were doing their own thing. David got the city of Jerusalem, conquered it, brought the ark of God there to unify the nation. The northern nations and the southern nation right there in Jerusalem was the center of the entire nation. And then Solomon came and expanded the kingdom and that was the glory days. Mm. But then you had bad kings who came afterwards and the whole kingdom began to degenerate until the Babylonians came, took them away, then they came back after 70 years, and now they're in the same situation again, where the Romans have taken control, and the disciples, this is a longing that the Jewish people had, that God was going to restore the kingdom, God was going to bring justice. Here's a messianic prophecy concerning the Messiah, Isaiah 65 verse 16 verse 5, in mercy the throne will be established, the one, that's the Messiah, will sit on it in truth, uh, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice uh, and hastening righteousness. So that was a prophecy that the Jewish people were holding on to. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to bring justice up when he brings up back the kingdom because this is something they all wanted, justice. And justice is a big deal in the Bible. You know, Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed is anyone who withholds justice from the foreigner, from the fatherless, or from the widow. So we understand that there are various scriptures that speak about justice. God is a God of justice. And you know what? Church has been very much involved in justice throughout the centuries. I talked about the black civil rights movement in America, which was started by the black churches there in the American South. Uh, uh, when it came to slavery, the Methodists, the Baptists, and the Moravians uh, were the ones who preached the gospel and opposed uh, slavery, knowing that it was shameful for people who believe in Jesus uh, to be indifferent to something uh, as unjust as slavery. Are you hearing me today, church? Uh, all through history, the church has been involved in proclaiming justice in the world. And I've said that because right now there's a lot of tension in churches, uh, contention, even confusion, because uh, there are Christians who don't know how to address, especially in the light of George Floyd, what to do when it comes to social justice. 
What is our role in this all in this thing? Uh, should we not make uh, social justice a priority? Uh, some people say we're not emphasizing it enough, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know the scriptures, like I said, speak about justice. Uh, we should be out there in light of police abuse, uh, in light of sex trafficking, uh, in light of climate change, uh, in light of racism and poverty and inequality, and all these things. Uh, we should be out there. You know, there are people who have churches. To evangelical churches to join what they call progressive churches uh, because they see the injustices in society and think that the, the church in general uh, is not doing anything about it. Mm. So I want to look at this issue today, church, because, uh, you know, I'll be honest, since the whole pandemic started, I, it's like I have to become some sort of professor. I have to learn uh, immunology. <laughs> I had to learn intersectionality. I had to learn gender relations and, and social media, and critical race theory, and, and climate change. All of these kind of things. Uh, listen, man, I'm just a pastor, man. <laughs> just trying to pastor a church, and all of a sudden, I've got to be an expert on so many different things because people are coming to me with all kinds of questions about this and about that. And like, boy, I don't know. But let me tell you something, church. That's all going on right now. You got to understand there is a difference between. Biblical social justice and counterfeit social justice. Yeah, come on. You know what I'm saying? Not all social justice is the same. And yeah. just because it may say it is social justice, uh, it doesn't mean it is genuine social justice. So, you know, we can get all caught up in the emotion. Let me tell you something about emotion. Emotion can rob you from logic and reason. Yeah, that's good. Are you with me? Last year was a very emotional time, especially with the whole George Floyd thing. It was, it was, I saw, we all, most of us seen the video. It was a brutal act of murder. Amen. But you know, you can be so caught up in emotion that Satan can come in mm. and blindside you uh, with the idea of something that really is counterfeit. Listen to me today, church. Not everything that looks like social justice is of God. Mm. Hear me? Yeah, so in our text, so we looked at the Israelites there. They're walking with Jesus for three years. And for three years, they're looking for the kingdom of God. They're looking for Christ to be doing something. Uh, and, uh, and, and you know, in their mind, regardless of what Jesus said, in their mind, they're fixated with this one idea. Jesus is going to restore the kingdom. And Jesus addresses this issue a number of times because uh, Jesus knows it's not going to happen as easy as you think. So the Bible says in Luke 19, 11, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so that parable is about him. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to receive the kingdom from the Father, but right here on earth, I'm going to give you talents. You know the story, power of the talents. I'm going to give you this amount, you this amount, you that amount, uh, and occupy till I come, do business till I come, and I'm going to return one day and settle accounts. Didn't he say that? So he's trying to explain to them, listen guys, uh, it's not going to happen how you think, but they still... You know, we see our text uh, that even in Acts 1, they still, they couldn't wrap their mind around that. Mm. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom? Did I just explain to you what's going to happen? Mm. They can't because they have this idea stuck in their head that Jesus is going to come to restore justice. Lord, will you restore the kingdom? And Jesus puts it back on them. Verse 8, he says, no, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses. So, Lord, will you restore the kingdom? It says, it's not for you to know the times or the season under the Father's authority. But what I can tell you, you shall be witnesses. Amen. You shall receive power. So this is not about what am I going to do. This is what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying. He's put it back on them. Uh, and so, you know, I want to highlight something. As bad as the Roman Empire was then, the main issue for Jesus uh, wasn't social justice. He didn't say, go into all the world and free the slaves. Mm -hmm. Go into all the world and preach women's rights. Go into all of the world uh, and deal with the massive unemployment. Mm -hmm. He didn't say that. He said, go into the world and preach the gospel. And you got to understand, the Roman Empire is far worse than we have right now. Mm -hmm. 
You know, if Jesus was walking here right now, he would have never been crucified. Because we don't crucify people. Mm. Even if you are a serial killer, we don't crucify you. Mm. Ain't that true? Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so back in the Roman Empire, you had things like infanticide. People leave their children out in the elements for them to die. Uh, it, it, you know, outside in the elements, exposure. You know, you had things like slavery. You had things like totalitarianism. You had subjugation and conquest. Uh, and Christ did not call his disciples to deal with all of that. Mm. Now, why not? You may not wonder. Because the truth is, uh, what those things are, are symptoms to the problem. Yeah. The real problem is the issue of sin. That's right. Because, you know, I don't know if anyone, I remember as a kid, you know, we used to get these American games. What is it called? Whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole is, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, I don't know if they sell it here now, I'm pretty sure they start. Yeah, yeah. You whack one more and another one would pop up over here. You yeah. whack it again and the next one will pop over there. Yeah, yeah. And the idea is you try to keep them going. You know what I'm saying? And that is a problem when you deal with symptoms and not sin, is you're always trying to solve one problem. And when you solve that one problem, another one comes up, another one comes up. And I'm going to tell you something today, church. All of the injustices we see in the world come from one thing, sin. Mm -hmm. It comes from human selfishness uh, and humans wanting to do their own thing. Uh, and the truth is, what's the point of you get all the rights in the world and die and go to a devil's hell? Mm -hmm. Amen. Think about it. You got all the rights that there is to have. You have rights for everything. Amen. Uh, and then you die and then what happens? You stand before God in judgment. You see, Christ has to deal with the central issue at the end of the day, mm -hmm. and the issue is sin. Mm -hmm. Let me also just say this. You know, one of the things the church can be in danger of, and I'm going to balance this out, church. Though, though, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to drift off too far. But some of these issues that we're having to face many times is really a distraction yeah. from the real issue that's going on in the world. You know, and when you focus on distractions, uh, your central mission goes off. And once you lose sight of your central mission, everything falls apart in the end. Mm. You know, the Salvation Army used to be a fire breathing, fire preaching church. And now it's simply social services. Mm. A private form of social services, but social services nevertheless. Uh, and you start to really lose your importance uh, and your relevance in the world. Listen. Nobody can do church like the church. Yeah. And nobody can do what the people in the world do like people in the world. And when we try to do what they do, we'll always fail. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's seen the, last week, they, uh, uh, I think the anti-vaxxers stormed into the IT and news building. You think we could do that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or, 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 or uh, uh, extinct rebellion, just sit down in the streets and block traffic. You think we could do that? You know, you know, we we have we we don't think like that. So we would never be so so if we try to do what they do, we'll always come last. Yeah, yeah. It is the best thing we do is what we do best. Amen. And so I'm I'm gonna balance this out like I said, uh, but the truth is uh, what is the motive behind the things why people do what they do? I keep, I keep saying the issue is uh, people are talking about justice, uh, but a lot of times people really don't want justice. People want vengeance. Mm. And some people, it's not more vengeance, they want power. You know, uh, I, I'm still, well, I'm old enough now to remember when Zimbabwe was once Rhodesia. Now, you guys, young guys, have no idea what Rhodesia is, but Zimbabwe was once called Southern Rhodesia. Mm. It, was a, it was a wicked apartheid government run by a man named Ian Smith. And eventually, people rose up. Uh, under the leadership of a guy named Robert Mugabe, mm -hmm. and took over the Rhodesia, renamed it Zimbabwe, and Mugabe became a bigger devil than Ian Smith. Mm. You see what I'm saying? You know, in, in Jamaica, I learned a great proverb there. I nearly bust my gut when I heard it. Saying swapping, swapping a black dog for monkey. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In other words, it's just one thing you trade. You think you're gonna get something better, you get something ju just as bad or even worse. Mm. And so these things happen. You know, some of you may have heard of the riots in South Africa last month. You know, I'm, I'm half South African. I'm speaking to my cousins, and one of my cousins, Benita, she's a professor at the University of Natal. She says, she says it's worse now than it was during apartheid for poor people in Africa, in wow. South Africa. 
is and her neighborhood, she's, you know, you know, in England you have neighborhood watch, and this ain't no neighborhood watch. It's some grandma looking through the window, see if you're parking in, a, in, in front of her house. That's what neighborhood watch is. But in South Africa, there's real neighborhood watch. I remember people would go out late at night with shotguns. They would drive around the neighborhood, making sure no one got broken into. She says in her neighborhood, everyone had their guns out because they were looking to invade their area that they lived in. She says it's outrageous. Because the people who, think about it, Nelson Mandela suffered in prison, Nelson Mandela saved that country from civil war, but the guys that were with him thinking, you know what, we are not entitled to the riches of this country because of what we suffered. Joseph Suma, the previous president, is the most corrupt person I know, but, but he was in the whole struggle as well. So just because people are involved in these things, don't mean that their motive is necessarily right. Yeah. Are, are you hearing me today, church? Uh, you've got to not just consider the just cause. The just cause, get rid of apartheid. But is the solution right? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You've got to understand that today. Especially, and you know, I've got to kind of clarify something because one of the main doctrines creeping into the modern society is that of Marxism. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that. Mm -hmm. A man named Karl Marx back in the 1900s. Uh, and Karl Marx simply said politics is merely the organized power of one class for oppressing another. Mm -hmm. So that's what politics is. It's really one bunch of people oppressing another. And so better you oppress than be oppressed. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, Jesus says, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Marxism is this, do unto others before they do it unto you. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? That's really the mindset of all of this. And, and ain't no one seen these symbols with a fist in the hand. That's simply a Marxist. Regardless of what you, it, the root idea behind it uh, is we're going to take power back from yeah. others uh, and give it to the people. But the truth is the people never get it. It's always somebody who takes the power, who becomes just as bad as the people that we took the power from. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, you've got to be very careful what's going on. I understand, you know, uh, uh, Jamaica uh, uh, had a growth rate of 6% a year, every year, between independence in 1962 and 1972. 6% is a phenomenal growth rate for any country in the world. It was so uh, mind-blowing that, that Malaysia, Singapore, they, they came over to figure out how is it that this country is doing so well. The problem with Jamaica at the time, there was still a lot of issues coming over from colonialism. There was still inequalities uh, between rich and poor. There was still some form of racism and classism and, and all genuine issues and problems. Uh, and then the socialists came in and said, you know what? We see all of these problems uh, and we got to address these problems. And it's true, they, they recognize the problems. Mm -hmm. But just because you can recognize problems don't mean you have solutions. Yeah, sure. And so, one of the things that the leader said, a man named Michael Manley, he said, Jamaica has no, he got elected in 1972, he said, Jamaica has no room for millionaires. We have five flights a day to Miami, be on one. He said it to all of the, the upper classes. Wow. And what happened was, for the next six months, there's a great book called Dead Yard by Ian Thompson, he said, for the next six months, every flight to Miami was booked. And all of the middle and the upper classes left. And what happened was, the man achieved equality in Jamaica. He made everyone equally poor. <laughs> and Jamaica has never recovered ever since then. I, I, you hear what I'm saying? Yes, bro, you figured out the problem. There is inequality. There is racism. There is classism. You're 100% right. But your solution is all wrong. Sure. And we've got to recognize this, church. What is people's agendas behind social justice. Some of you guys remember that girl from Peckham, Sasha Johnson, mm -hmm. got shot in the head. And I remember reading how people said they're going to organize protests to protest against what happened to her until they found out it was uh, two black guys who shot her in the head. And then what happened to the protests? Isn't her life worth protesting? Isn't preach, you know, we're against black on black violence? Is that legitimate? But no, it doesn't meet the agenda. We really don't care about her life. We care about bringing down the system. We care about bringing down whitey. That's really what the case is. You know what I'm saying? So who cares if, you know, hey, if it was a white person who shot her dead, hey, that would, yeah, oh, justice! 
What is the agenda behind these things? You've got to check out the spirit behind these things uh, before you get, get involved in all of these things. Because uh, the issue is that black injustice is, is counterfeit social justice. Sure. Let me tell you something as I move on, man, because Christ is looking for witnesses. He's not looking for activists. Yes, that's right. Mm. Amen. And, 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 and again, listen, I'm not saying everything, you know, um, uh, what, what Winston Churchill said, he said, um, he says uh, that, that uh, democracy is the worst form of government except for everyone else, everything else. So, and he recognized that all man-made systems of governance is always will have a flaw. Yeah. And so I'm not here to say that Marxism is the only bad thing. You know, this whole thing going into Afghanistan is a madness. Mm -hmm. And everyone's seen what's going on. 20 years, $1 trillion, thousands of lives lost, and we're right back to square one. Actually, we're not even square one. We made the Taliban more powerful than ever before, giving them $80 billion worth of military equipment. Huh? I saw a video today of uh, uh, the Taliban flying Black Hawk helicopters. I mean, they're glad. It's uh, all these Christmas presents uh, that uh, America has given. And so uh, the point I'm trying to get across is, uh, is that there are things in this world that ultimately add up to a sum total of zero. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the real gospel, that is the only thing that can make an mm -hmm. ultimate difference when it comes to things. So going back to the idea of the kingdom of God, you know, I mentioned Luke 19, verse 11. Now when they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So I want you to think about that. Jesus is going to Jerusalem because he has to be crucified in Jerusalem. But in their mind, oh, hey, he's going to restore the kingdom now. He is going to bring the kingdom. He's going to kick the Romans' butts. That's their mindset. I want you to hold on to that because in Matthew 20, verse 17, it says, speaking about the same time period, now Jesus going up to Jerusalem, verse 20, the mother of Zebedee's sons, the sons are John and James, came to her with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Mm. So think about it. Jesus is going to Jerusalem. These guys are like, hey, hey, this is it. This is it. Jesus is going to kick the Roman butt. Woo. That's why right. that's not necessarily true. Mm. And so Christ says, listen, I want you to be witnesses. I want you to be witnesses of me. Of my, I want you to testify of my saving power because only I can deal with the issue of sin and self-righteousness and self-agendas that is in the human beings. Only he can shine a light on who we really are, expose the issues in our hearts that we can be right before God and really change. Activism only deals with symptoms. Mm -hmm. Amen. Being yeah. a witness deals with the problem, church. Mm -hmm. So when Christ died and he rose again, think about it. He defeated the greatest cause of injustice, sin. And think about it, Jesus himself was unjustly treated, and in the unjust treatment, uh, he created justice for all. Because now, through faith in Christ, we are justified to, in, in front of the Father. Amen. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, to put to death in the flesh, but be made alive by the Spirit. Now, if you're here today, you, you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. You've had to accept that you are unjust. Because Christ is a just who died for the unjust. How can unjust people bring justice? Huh? How can unjust human beings bring about real and true justice? Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Yeah. All of us, the best of us, uh, we are all fallen creatures uh, and we are all in ourselves incapable of bringing real justice because yeah. as you look in the world today, the people are looking for justice for their cause is only bringing oppression to other people. We're looking for just causes when it comes to things like the LGBTQ community. Yeah? And what, the, what happens is less justice for Christian community. Mm, come on. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? This is how it is. 
there, there is no ultimate justice. There is no justice that is going to be a holistic thing unless you address the issue of sin. Are you with me today? So whatever cause uh, is going on, it is always going to be off balance because uh, of the nature of sin. Now, yeah. now I see in America where, uh, uh, you know what, we want to come against the, the white man. The white man is the worst form of person in the world. You know what I mean? You can be black, uh, woman, you can be all this, but uh, you know what I'm saying? And, and, mm -hmm. and so th that's, that's a, a fair system is okay. The past, there was slavery, there was racism, there was all of that. But this new society, everybody's equal. Why are you picking on one group because of the past? That they were never involved in, but their ancestors were. Do you see what I'm saying? It is not justice. It cannot be justice. Uh, it is something that is warped. And all these things do is, let me tell you, it always flips the other way. Things flip from one to the other. America come and take over Afghanistan, and then uh, the Taliban come and take it back over again. These yeah. things flip. And let me tell you something, if you are on one side too hard, the pendulum is going to swing and hit you back harder the other way coming because everything is cyclical when it comes to the issue of justice or what we perceive to be justice in this world. Yeah, we right. cannot be caught up in the world's mindset of justice. And Christ, uh, as I'm coming to an end, uh, he says, uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know, sermons have been preached about this scripture, about being baptized in the Holy Spirit and all that. And, and all that is important. Uh, but there's something that was important about this. Because when the disciples got baptized with the Holy Spirit, they stopped talking about when are you going to restore the kingdom. And they began to tell everybody about Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, after Acts 1, there's never any mention of it anymore. Acts 2, they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and from Acts 2 to Acts chapter uh, uh, 7, they're evangelizing in Judea. Acts chapter 8, they're in Samaria. In Acts chapter 10, they're starting to reach out to the Gentiles. Because there's, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit made them realize that it's more than just us getting our justice. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that the gospel needs to go out. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting in the early days of the church uh, is that evangelism was only towards the Jews for the first 10 years or so. It's only in Acts chapter 10, the Bible says when Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision, or those who were Jewish, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out unto the Gentiles, or the non-Jews also. Mm -hmm. So when the baptism of the Holy Spirit took over non-Jewish people, they were blown away. Because up until that point, the only thought salvation was for Jewish people. These wow. said the baptism of the Holy Spirit changed all of the them and us mentality. Yeah. You know, because Cornelius was one of the oppressors. He was a centurion in the Roman Empire. You know what I'm saying? It was a, hey, we're the, the down with this guy, he's one of the oppressors. No, the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon him as well. And the Jewish people were astonished. Because the reality was uh, that God does not differentiate between people. Sure. All men and women are sinners uh, who need Jesus uh, in their lives. And so I'm not talking about the lack of, uh, should we be involved in social justice? Absolutely. But let us remember what comes first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And let us remember this. The church has always led when it comes to these things. Mm -hmm. We have never been the tail. We don't follow other people. You know what I'm saying? You know, they follow us. They follow our lead. And if we are following someone else's lead, something is wrong. Yeah. Number one, it shows weakness. And number two, if they're leading uh, and we're in the background, then, then, then something, something ain't right. Because uh, God ain't going to call unsaved to lead where the church should be leading. So we've got to catch ourselves, church, uh, and recognize social justice needs the Spirit of God for discernment, for empowerment and for do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Things have to be done. Like I said, the Methodists, the Baptists couldn't sit by and allow our slavery to continue. They had to fight. They, you know, there's a very interesting, I did a, a three part uh, a study last year uh, during Black History on the role of the, the, the Baptists and the Methodists uh, in, in, in coming against slavery in Jamaica, how the state church, the, the Church of England, burned down Methodist and Baptist churches uh, and Moravian churches for preaching the gospel back in the 1830s uh, wow. and whatnot. Uh, but they kept on doing it nevertheless until the back of slavery was broken. That's true mm. social justice. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's something the church, when God deals with us, when we see the need, we will know when we need to rally and we need to rise and do something for God. God will speak to us. Amen. God will show us and say, this issue, it needs to be addressed by my people. I want to close with a, a story. Mm. Everyone knows the Salvation Army uh, for social work and homelessness and drug related issues. But does anyone know the time they were involved in child trafficking? <coughs> Wow. Now, now, before it sounds as bad as it does, it's actually a lot better. So, in 1885, um, the Salvation Army was just starting to gain traction in East London. And they were working a lot, you know, preaching the gospel, but also involved in social activities, helping the homeless, helping young girls. A lot of young girls were involved in child prostitution back in the late 1800s, uh, and they were sick and tired of seeing these young girls uh, being basically sold for sex, even by their own parents, uh, and uh, they wanted something done about it. So they began to petition Parliament to do something about it. Uh, and every time they got a Christian who was an MP to push a bill in, they would reject the bill. And one after the other, they reject all of these bills. And so in 1885, they had a, a, another bill called the Criminal Law Amendment Bill and it was thrown out. You know, and this, this bill was, listen, girls as young, you know, 13 year old girls should not be involved in sex trafficking. They should not be involved in prostitution. We want the age of consent to be raised from 13. But the government kept throwing it out. And so what happened was, Bramwell Booth, the son of William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army, he got the, uh, the editor of a newspaper called the Paul Moore Gazette. And together they said, how are we going to deal with this thing? How can we, because the government is listening to us, what are we going to do? So they said, you know what, what we're going to do? We're going to get a girl, we're going to buy a young girl, and we're going to take her to, uh, 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 to France. So right. together they, talk, they, they they met up with this woman who used to be a prostitute and also a brothel keeper who got saved in the Salvation Army. And they mm -hmm. said, listen man, can we find a girl, girl that we can buy and we, we can traffic her to France? And so that's what they did. They, they, they found a 13-year-old young girl named Eliza Armstrong. They bought her from her mother for five pounds and took her to France. And then this man, I think his name was William Stead, he, he wrote an article in his newspaper showing how easy it was to traffic a young child from England all the way to France. Mm. You know, and, and it was a big scandal in 1885. I mean, outrage, uproar, people are vexed, people are upset. Uh, and so uh, when it broke out, the scandal broke out, the Salvation Army in three weeks got 400,000 signatures wow. from people all across the world and saying, we've got to deal with this thing. The, the roll of paper was two and a half miles long. That's how long the amount of signatures uh, that they got. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, but the three of them got arrested uh, for obscenity and, and for uh, kidnapping uh, because they got them on a technicality because they bought the daughter, the, the girl, from her mother, but the law said you can only, uh, uh, um, only the father can give the daughter permission. And so because of that technicality, and both of them were drunks, mm -hmm. on that technicality, the woman was a convert and uh, the editor, they got prison sentences, uh, mm -hmm. Bramwell Boothy fortunately got off. But even though they got arrested and thrown in prison, the government changed the age of consent from 13 to 16, which it is today. Wow. Because the Salvation Army did it. Because yeah. while they were preaching the gospel at the time, God showed them that, listen, this is an injustice that needs to be faced uh, because these young girls are being exploited by wicked, perverted people. Uh, and they made a lasting impact on Britain to this day. Mm -hmm. Because I'm tell you, when God challenges us to be involved, mm -hmm. we've got to know about it. Mm -hmm. And we've got, to be, uh, we've got to do what we can to make real justice, not just pushing our own agenda, but for the sake and the health of everyone that is involved. So Christian, recognize the difference between counterfeit social justice and real social justice. At the end of the day, Christ Jesus died for unjust human beings uh, that we could be made just before the Father. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Could I have everybody back? Maybe as you were listening to this message today, something has stirred in your heart and you want to give your life to God. 
The Bible is very clear that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus died for us and that he rose again on the third day, we will be saved. That if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The Bible also tells us that God is faithful and just, that if we confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have all messed up, done things that we're not proud of, and we instinctively know that there is a God in heaven who's going to judge us one day. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died for you to wipe your slate clean. He was a substitute for you. He took your place. If you put your hope and your faith in this Jesus, if you would speak to him right now and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, turn and run to him, he will save you. He will help you. We have so many people that have come to Jesus and had their lives radically turned around by the power of his presence and grace. And if that's you, you want to receive Jesus. Jesus in your life as your personal Lord and Savior, make that prayer today in the description and contact us. We want to pray with you. We want to help you on this journey and give you all the resources that you need to make it. God bless you and thank you again. We pray that you have found this content helpful and we want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you can be alerted every time we upload something and we pray that our content, especially in these last days, will be a blessing to you and draw you closer to Christ. If you want to find out more about the Sydenham Church, feel free to contact us. The details are in the description or visit our website at www.sydenhamcc.com.